All right, hello everybody. Uh, welcome to Statistics for Linguistics, uh, or Statistics for Linguists, I guess, which uh, goes under the uh, titles of Ling 560 or Ling 660. They have different, there's two different courses, one for undergrads, one for grads, wherever you came from. They have two different names for the courses, but uh, I uh, am gonna call it Statistics for Linguists, just to keep it simple. Um, I'm your host, uh, your host and your instructor, Professor Steve. Uh, and today we're going to talk about the basics just to get started. Uh, we're going to look at measures of central tendency in stats, and I'll explain what that means here in a second. Let me get my PowerPoint fired up. So yeah, what are we doing here? Um, just give you a few sort of um, background notes and caveats about how we're going to work through this course uh, in this fashion. But primarily, we're going to be learning stats from a lot of language-based data uh, with a few other fun data points thrown into the mix. So we're all linguists. Uh, we all have some experience with working with language or analyzing language. So that's kind of where I want to keep the focus. There are other things that I am interested in, and you'll find that out today. Uh, so I'm going to throw in some data from other parts of the world as well, but we're going to work on it um, all basically, uh, basically in a way to try to understand statistics uh, to help us basically do our own research and our own analysis of our own data, uh, become independent researchers in that fashion to the greatest extent that we're able. So um, I talk about this more in when I walk through the syllabus for the course, but the goal is to uh, get you up and running by the time you're done with this course so that you can do your own stats. Uh, and to do that, we kind of have to go and fast forward through a lot of these concepts. Um, but like I said, we're going to try to keep it relatively familiar by looking at it through the lens of language. Uh, or linguistics. Our textbook is kind of written for that purpose. Um, my version of this textbook has been used quite a bit over the years. It's called Quantitative Methods in Linguistics. Uh, it's by Keith Johnson, who I used to work with uh, back in my Ohio State days. Uh, this one's kind of falling apart a little bit. Uh, it's still good though. Um, you can still learn a lot from it uh, and I'll be your guide as we work through the textbook together. Um, so make sure you have that on hand because it'll help make a lot um, everything a lot easier to understand. Uh, as well, I often will grab sort of resources from other um, basically publications, textbooks as well, where I think they might be handy. I used to, when I first started teaching this course, use a um, textbook called Introduction to the Practice of Statistics, Statistics which I thought um, kind of gave a good intro at a very basic mathematical level that's more designed for just like any undergraduate student of linguist or statistics not linguistics uh and so that kind of did a good job of um, covering the basic concepts pretty well so I'll, I'll borrow some definitions from that textbook in this um, lecture today uh this one though is um again geared more towards linguists who want to do their own research um using quantitative data of whatever sort you get from a sort of linguistics experiment. Uh, we're also going to learn how to do statistical analysis by using the R software package. Um, I'll load mine up here right now. Um, I have separate videos for how to install this on your machine, but this is what it looks like in on a Mac. Uh, it works a little bit differently on a PC versus a Mac. Uh, and I have far more experience or expertise at this point on working with R in Mac mode. Uh, I know a little bit about how it works in a PC, but you do have to make a translation sometimes. I'm gonna give you lots of examples about how to do this with a Mac, um, and we can talk about the translations as we go. Uh, we're not gonna do much with R today. Uh, we'll work on it in far more complex ways as we go. Um, but just to get you started, this is what it looks like. And R is, um, it's a command line interface, uh, at least the basic form of it that I'm going to use here, uh, which is not sort of user friendly uh, as uh, like a GUI or a graphical user interface, which most people are um, used to now uh, in the 2020s. Uh, having grown up with computers back in the 80s and 90s, I'm used to sort of like with MS-DOS, that sort of thing, uh, used to sort of just typing commands into a computer. So it's familiar for me uh, and might take you a little bit of time to um, get used to it yourself but the reason we're going to use it is just because it's super powerful and it also happens to be free which is nice uh as it says so here uh and it can do all sorts of things basically anything you really need to do with stats um it just takes a little while to get up and running with that so part of this um course is going to be about just learning statistical concepts and how and when to apply them and the other part will be how to use this tool of r um which is 
super powerful, but a little bit complicated to, um, to run. Um, so we're going to try to learn all this in a semester's time. Uh, and I'm making videos of this, uh, again, like I made videos of my other courses, lectures for my other courses last summer, because uh, I'm not exactly sure what's going to happen with the pandemic this fall. So just in case, um, you know, things, the world blows up again, uh, and we all have to sort of shelter in our homes uh, and can't have in-person teaching. Uh, you have these videos that you can use as reference. And even if that doesn't happen, if you just want to watch the lectures again and try to get a better understanding of what I was saying the second time around, you can fast forward and rewind as much as you want. So here we are. Um, the last thing I'm going to say before we get into this is that I am not a real statistician. Um, there are plenty of real statisticians out there. I am just a linguist who happens to really like numbers and I run experiments uh, at the same time. So uh, you get lots of numbers and for your data when you run experiments in whatever sort of you know science you might be a practitioner of. Uh, and stats will be, statistical analysis will be useful for interpreting what those numbers are trying to tell you no matter what kind of experiment you run. Um, so this is something that's just a tool to trade as far as um, my profession is concerned. That's something that I have to do and that if you want to become a professional linguist, uh, you will probably have to do as well. So that's why we're here to just learn how to do this sort of aspect of our job. And there are other people who can do it better than me. So uh, I'm not going to be, um, I'm not going to pretend at all about that. Uh, and to a lot of great extent, uh, a lot of this is sort of some um, sort of information and uh, concepts I picked up on my own along the way. I'm going to try to explain what I understand about it as well as I can, uh, again, to try to get you to the point where you can do this on your own, <clears throat> on your own, when I set you off into the world to run your own experiments for your honors thesis or for your grad research or whatever. However, uh, that being said, um, if you do have like uh, a set of data from whatever experiment you've run, uh, and you're not entirely sure how to analyze it, there's usually easy ways to find statisticians like in the statistics department who will like, help guide you through the analysis of your own data. Um, so I'd recommend that you check out those resources uh, if they're available to you. Um, yeah, so that being said, uh, let's get into it. Um, and what I want to, the way I want to get into it on the first day uh, is, well, number one, it's going to be a little bit different from the way I normally teach this course because uh, normally there's a lot of writing on the board that happens, um, quite a bit actually. Um, I'm not going to try to do this through these videos uh, because number one, I have the world's worst handwriting anyway, so you will be spared the task of having to try to read it. Um, but it's just going to be, you know, logistically awkward to try to like do things on a blackboard while I'm recording a video like this. So I've tried to convert everything to PowerPoint format, at least for this lecture. We'll see how the f future ones look. Um, and uh, I also kind of want to start out uh, just to get comfortable with concepts that you may already know anyways, um, just to show you that you do know what you kind of need to know to at least begin this subject uh, and we'll build from there. Okay, so what is statistics? You might not know the answer to that question. Um, hopefully you already know what linguistics is at this point in your careers, but what is stats? Um, I'm gonna give you a couple of answers to this question, um, the ones that I got from Keith's textbook. Um, but uh, I will say one thing that's um, a kind of a negative definition of stats. It's not mathematics, it's not just arithmetic. There's more involved with stats than what you do in math in terms of like making proofs or um, you know calculating the answers to equations, that sort of thing. In stats, we can use stats or statistical analysis to do a variety of different things. So the first of those is data reduction. Give me a second. Which means that you can summarize trends, capture the common aspects of a set of observations, et cetera, et cetera. You have a whole huge batch of numbers you might get from your experiment. Data reduction is just trying to simplify what you see in those numbers to something a little more manageable, uh, a little more digestible for a person who's trying to figure out what's going on in it. Um, along with that, statistics provides us with a tool whereby we can make inferences in a principled manner where we generalize from a representative set of observations, our data, to a larger universe of possible observations using hypothesis tests. Um, so this is something that as linguists, we kind of do intuitively anyways, say if we're looking at um, like a batch of, uh, say word forms in a language and we start to figure out, oh, you know, there's like a phonological rule here where we get like nasal place assimilation or something like that. Or, you know, maybe we can just look at a few sentences from 
whatever language and say, oh, it's SOV, it's not SVO, that sort of thing. And we make generalizations like that. If we're linguists, we're probably pretty good at doing that pretty quickly, um, just intuitively on the basis of a small set of data. In stats, though, we make inferences in a more principled fashion because one of the things that we learn through stats is that the world is really messy. It usually doesn't obey absolute rules all the time, and there's variation everywhere we look. So we want to come up with sort of a set of ground rules for making that leap from our representative set of data to this larger universe of like every kind of thing that might happen in the world using what we call hypothesis tests here. Um, it takes a while to wrap your, hand, your head around how that works exactly. It's not the same thing we normally do in linguistics. So we'll get to that as it comes, but just be prepared to uh, accept the fact that it's gonna could be a little bit uncomfortable when you first start doing it. It may not make sense immediately. And that's why we're gonna go walk through it relatively slowly or walk through it more than one time if you keep rewinding these videos and watch them over and over again. Okay, so we have data reduction, uh, simplifying all the numbers, inference, making a conceptual leap based on what the numbers are telling us. Uh, we also have discovery of relationships, which is where we try to find descriptive or causal patterns in the data. Um, yeah, that gets into topics like causation and correlation, which you may already know are not exactly the same thing. We'll talk about that further as we get into the semester. Also exploration of probabilistic processes um, that includes theoretical modeling, um, things like information theory, that sort of thing, developing um, sort of a model with different factors to try to account for all the variation that we see in the data. Uh, we'll talk about all these things as we go. <clears throat> They are quite powerful tools once you get the hang of them. Uh, and we're only gonna kind of start with the basics by the end of the semester in this class, but um, that's the goal is to sort of give you the power to empower you uh, to do your own research and understand it in a sort of principled statistical manner, uh, I guess you could say. Uh, for today though, we are going to focus on um, data reduction. We're gonna start at the start. Uh, so, for that, just another reminder, statistics, like science in general, can help us simplify our view of the world to help make it more conceptually manageable. Uh, so that's what data reduction is gonna try to do for us, or we're gonna try to do with data reduction uh, in today's lecture. Um, so that's our big picture goal for today, at least to get started on that. Um, before we dig into all that though, I have some questions. And normally I ask these questions in class and people come up with a variety of interesting answers to them. Uh, as I ask them, you can think about what answer you would have for them normally, uh, but I'm not gonna wait for you to respond because I'm just talking to a screen right now uh, and you can't respond. Um, so anyways, the first question I normally ask is what's a variable? <clears throat> think about that for a sec. And if you wanna think about a variable in terms of like, the algebraic concept that you learned in high school math um, from whenever you took that back in the day, uh, that's fine. Uh, the way we're gonna define a variable, because we're gonna use a lot of those variables um, in this class, but a variable, uh, we'll go with this definition. It's a quantity that may assume any one of a set of values. So if you have your variable X, it could take on the value one or negative one or 25 or something like that. Uh, it just some, representation of uh, something that varies. <laughs> That's why it's called a variable. So it's an entity whose value can be different um, given different sort of observations or different conditions. Um, yeah, that's a variable. So normally we represent those with letters because they represent different numbers basically. Um, and if you want to go ahead and think about that again, in terms of like the algebraic definition, that's fine. Number two, my question is what's a distribution? Um, I'll let you think about that for a second. The definition we'll go with is it's an arrangement of statistical data that exhibits the frequency of the occurrences of the values of a variable. Uh, so this is why I wanted to talk about variables first. So we have some variable X and it can give us different numeric values uh, depending on say different observations or what have you. Uh, and we can pr paint a picture of like the different values that variable can take by um, presenting them in the form of a distribution. Um, so, right, a di distribution is simply, you can think of it in those terms, it's a picture of how the values of a variable vary. <laughs> um, and say, often, we'll get to this next time, but people are generally familiar with um, 
what is colloquially, colloquially called a bell-shaped curve or a bell curve. Uh, you might know that as a normal distribution, which is this kind of loopy thing that goes up and down in the middle. Uh, and that just shows you, say, in some particular you know, average value, you get observations of the variable having that value a lot of times. And then on the tails of the distribution, you get fewer observations um, at sort of the extremes of the distribution. Uh, it's just a picture which shows you how many times you get particular values for a variable. Question number three, what's a sample? Let's take another sip of water. <clears throat> a sample is, um, an important concept for statistics, but it's also something that we do all the time in uh, running, doing experimental research or running any sort of experimental study. Um, so I'll define sample here as a selected part of a population of interest taken to represent the entire population in some meaningful way. Um, so uh, again, you can think of this in terms of language, like if I want to go figure out what, you know, let's say, how do Canadian English speakers pronounce the vowel and the word goat? Um, well, I'm not likely to go out and interview all whatever 40 million Canadian English speakers there are these days. Maybe there's not that many, uh, 35, 30, whatever. I don't have to, I can take a sample, right? And I can probably take a sample by like, you know, talking to maybe 20 different Canadian English speakers because that's all the time I have and all the money I have time for anyways. And I hope that those like 20 Canadian English speakers will represent the grand total of Canadian English speakers in the world in some like vertical and meaningful way. Um, just taking a small subset of the population, the whole population is all the Canadian English speakers in the world. The sample is a su subset of that population of interest, which legitimately represents that entire population. So we've got a variable quantity that may assume any one of a set of values. We've got a distribution, um, which is basically a picture of how the variable, the variable varies. <laughs> and we've got a sample, which is a selected part of a population of interest. Um, I didn't ask what about a population exactly, but um, when I'm talking about a population, that means everybody in some group. So the population of Canadian English speakers is everybody in the world who speaks Canadian English, whatever that means. Um, and then there's questions of how you define that exactly, so on and so forth. But population means everybody. Sample is a subset of that everybody. Okay, so we're going to look at how to describe distributions in three ways um, as we get through the sort of intro part of this course. Uh, the first one that we're going to focus on today is called uh, measures of central tendency. Uh, and you may be already familiar with those or either not. Uh, it's okay either way. Um, and there's also shape. So we've got central tendency, we've got shape. And like I said, a distribution gives you a picture of how a variable varies. Uh, and an important part of that picture is the shape that the distribution forms. We're gonna look at that primarily through making graphs, which are easy to do in R. And R can make some really amazingly beautiful graphs. So that's one of the reasons we use it. Uh, and then thirdly, there's also measures of spread. Um, so when we look at, say, central tendency or spread, we're talking more in terms of like some sort of numeric output or numeric value that describes a distribution. When we look at shape, that's a curve. That's a, you know, a graphical view of what the distribution looks like. So one and three are more about numbers, two more about pictures. Either way, we're just going to focus on one for today just to kind of get rolling. Uh, and like I said, to try to get comfortable. Okay, so what I want to talk about next uh, is P's. Um, so, uh, a while back, um, one of the first times I taught this course, actually eight years ago now, uh, when I was, uh, kind of, uh, when my wife and I were still sort of in the courtship phase, uh, she, uh, grew, she had a backyard garden, um, uh, at our place here. So she, uh, just the one and only one time that she did this, uh, she comes from, uh, Ukraine, which is kind of, a, you know, you gotta have a backyard garden sort of culture. Um, and she wanted to sort of transplant that ethic over to uh, our place here uh, and was very enthusiastic about it the first time uh, and then included um, growing her own peas, uh, which was fun because we had fresh, fresh vegetables by the time um, summer was over. Uh, and so why am I talking about all this? Uh, so basically, uh, at some point when we finally harvested the peas, which was fun, uh, I did only the fun work, none of the real work. Uh, we each took a handful of pods and I kept stats on how many peas were in each pod. Um, Cause why not? 
I like counting things. Uh, and the other reason why is that Svetlana often describes herself as lucky. So I wanted to find out whether she was going to consistently get more peas than I was. Um, so I'm going to show you the results of this little experiment on the next slide. Uh, I'm going to point out a little thing here in case you're confused uh, about why I spelled peas with an E at the end. Uh, you may already know this as a linguist, uh, but back in the old days of English, um, peas were a mass noun. So you, if you ate some peas, uh, you weren't eating, I guess, a lot of individual little green spheres. You were just eating some peas, like this mass of vegetable stuff, uh, sort of like the same way we eat some corn nowadays. Uh, and then over time, um, people, I guess, kind of reinterpreted this. I don't want to say they got confused, but because it ends in an S, people interpreted that as like a plural and like there's an individual P now that you could have. And then you can have multiple Ps, uh, sort of like eating individual kernels of corn, which is probably not how you think of it. You just eat corn. Uh, you used to eat peas with an E at the end. Now we eat a whole bunch of little peas. Uh, so anyways, that's the linguistics fun for this. Um, in case you're getting bored by me talking about numbers, we're going to look at how many P's I got versus how many P's Svetlana got. We have to think of them as a count noun either way. Uh, so I'll say place your bets now whether you think um, Svetlana is luckier than me or not in terms of P's in the backyard garden pods. So this is the data. And normally I write this out on the board just to kind of like give people time to digest it. Ha ha. Um, I don't know how many bad jokes I can squeeze into this lecture, but I'll try to put as many as I can. Um, anyways, this is what um, this looks like. We each had 12 pods uh, and then we counted how many peas were in each one. So like this is in, you know, we didn't have the same pod, obviously, but my first pod had seven peas in it. Her first pod had eight peas in it, so on and so forth. And then we uh, had 12 total. Um, right. So how can we determine whether either of us was consistently getting more peas than the other? Which one of us was luckier or, you know, more bountiful in our uh, pea harvesting process? Uh, think about that for a second. Maybe you have a good answer. If you do, put it in the comment section. Uh, one way we can think about it, though, is just by calculating the average. So if we can go back to this, we have a lot of numbers, 12 each for both um, me and my wife. Um, if we calculate the average of each sample, maybe we can get a sense of which of us was picking more peas out of their pods altogether. Um, and I said that, um, and maybe you just already had a sense of what an average is, but it's worthwhile to think of what the answer to that question is as well. Um, so what is an average? Um, I put average in quotes here because there's actually more than one way to interpret it. So usually people, when you say average, they will interpret it as the arithmetic mean of a sample. Um, so one thing I'm going to point out here, I said well, I wanted to talk about measures of central tendency in, in a, as a way, a property of distributions, uh, a way to describe a distribution um, of a variable. So an average or an arithmetic mean is a measure of central tendency. And uh, in case you don't know, the arithmetic mean is calculated by summing up all the values in a sample and then dividing that total by the number of items in that sample. Um, and again, this is a case where it'd be valuable to walk you through this just by writing it out on a board. So I'm going to try to do this relatively slowly and give you all the sort of mathematical machinery behind the scenes um, as well. So for our particular example, we have 12 different P-pod values in the two samples, Steve's sample and Svetlana's sample. Uh, we're going to add up each of those values separately, one set of 12 values for me and one set of 12 values for my wife. And then we divide the resulting sum by 12. Um, so if you want to do that um, <clears throat> mathematically or algebraically, what it could look like is this formula or equation. So um, what I've got here is this representation uh, of X with a line over it. And that's how we're going to represent means or should represent means, um, technically speaking. This uh, symbol X with a bar over it is pronounced X bar in stats, which is a little bit unfortunate because that phrase X bar means so t something totally different in syntax. So uh, go ahead and insert your best syntax jokes joke there. I'm not going to make one. 
uh, because I'm a phonetician. Uh, either way, uh, I'm going to think about this in terms of um, the average or the mean. And what it represents is that I'm adding up all these individual values that I got um, from my sample, 12 total. Uh, so x sub 1 is just the number of p's I got in my first p pod. x sub 2 is the number of p's I got in my second p pod, so on and so forth. Add those all up together, and since I had 12 total, divide that sum by 12. Um, yeah, so I've got this further notation uh, definition here of x1 representing the first value in a sample, x2, the second value, so on and so forth, and all the way up to x12, which represents the 12th and final value in each sample. Um, so if I wanted to be really clear about this, um, like since we're talking about two different samples, uh, I might say use the variable x to represent um, my sample of p pods, uh, and I could use the variable y to represent my wife's, I suppose. Uh, and in her case, you'd be looking at like y sub one plus y sub two plus y sub three, so on and so forth. And then you get y bar at the end of the day. Uh, so you'd have two different averages there, x bar and y bar. You can think of it as like Steve's average or Svetlana's average, so on and so forth. Um, what you get out of this, um, it's a lot of words to kind of describe a relatively mathematically simple process. Uh, you sum everything up for each peapod collector. Svetlana got 88 peas and I got 83 peas. Divide those totals by the number of pods that we collected, which is 12. And Svetlana's mean is 7.333 and Steve's mean is 6.91666, so on and so forth. This keeps repeating, right? Uh, so 88 divided by 12 is about 7.3. Uh, or seven, uh, it's technically seven and a third. <clears throat> 83 divided by 12 is 6.9166, so on and so forth. Uh, or whatever, six and 11 twelfths. So yeah, Svetlana's mean or her average is higher than mine. So yeah, it's possible that she is luckier than I am, uh, especially when it comes to gardening. Although if you saw a picture of us both, you'd probably say I was the lucky one. Um, anyways, <laughs> moving on. Uh, before I get any cornier than that. Um, if you'd like to think about things that are not vegetables in my backyard garden, say linguistic-y things, uh, then it might be useful to come up with a more general form of this equation for the mean. Um, and the way we're going to do this is that um, when you calculate averages, you're not cal always going to calculate averages of just like 12 samples of something, right? Uh, it can be any number of different things that you might be collecting or counting. Uh, so to state that more generally, we'll say let's sum up a total of n samples rather than just 12. And this is a nice example, again, of a variable. It's kind of like a different order variable because uh, it's like the number of items you have in a sample of some other variable. But n can be the total number of items in your sample, and it can vary from one to whatever, right? Uh, in this particular case, we had 12. If we had just taken three p-pods each, then we would, n would have been equal to three. Um, and I'm actually gonna pause here now that I think about it. Uh, <clears throat> you see n, uh, or people refer to n quite a bit in social science research, uh, talking, usually referring to n as say the number of subjects you have in your study, like what was your n? Uh, well, my n was 25. Canadian English speakers or something like that. Um, so yeah, that's basically the number of samples you're taking overall. And we can use it in this context to make our formula a little more general than it was before. So we still have this X bar over here on the left-hand side, but on the right-hand side, uh, it looks a little bit different. So before the top part added up X sub one plus X sub two plus so on and so forth, all the way to X sub 12. In this case, I'm sort of glossing over the middle of that by saying um, dot dot, dot uh, x, sub, x sub one plus x sub two plus dot dot dot, a lot of x sub somethings, until you get to x sub n, whatever that n happens to be. And we don't have to specify it, right? It just can be whatever value or number of samples you took. Uh, and then instead of dividing by 12, we divide by n, right? This is the general form of this equation. Um, in case there's any ambiguity about this, um, I'm starting this off as x sub one plus x sub two, so on and so forth. Um, you don't have to have any more than one item in your sample here. It'd be a little weird to like take one pea pod and open it up and say, I have six peas in my pea pod. I'm getting an average of six peas out of my pea pods. You normally wouldn't calculate an average for just one item in a sample, but you could. The math basically works out the same way. Um, 
n can be any number basically is what i'm saying any integer um so i think i walk through that more here just to be clear here though i'm going to simplify the um, notation a little bit more <clears throat> um uh, by replacing all of this addition in the top part of this fraction with uh, this symbol sigma. It's a capital sigma from the Greek language. Uh, and the reason we're using it is because it represents the S sound in ancient Greek sigma, uh, which is the same sound at the beginning of the word summation or to sum up something. Um, so it's gonna what it's gonna do for us is make it so that we don't have to sort of put all these different little variables in a row like this. And we can write this equation more generally, like in this form down here. Um, so I'm gonna also talk about this another, another uh, term, just in case you're not um, familiar with it, but the numerator is everything above the line in this fraction here. The denominator is just the n at the bottom. So I'm trying to just basically simplify how I write out the numerator. And the way uh, we can do it um, algebraically is using this notation. So uh, I've got more details on this next slide. Um, so in this notation, instead of writing out each little x sub one, x sub two, x sub three, so on and so forth, we express them all as x sub i. So again, we've got another variable working here. Uh, i is gonna be basically the index code uh, of each sample you got um, for your variable, whatever it happens to be. Um, and then we've got this other stuff here. So I said the big sigma here means that we're adding things up, we're summing them up. Uh, and then we've got this sort of um, interesting notation of i equals one on the bottom right of the sigma symbol up to n here on the uh, upper right of the sigma symbol. Um, and so what that means is that um, x sub i, <clears throat> i is replacing these ones, twos, threes down here that were subscripted before. Um, and I'm gonna have i go from one to n. So the notation indicates the value of the subscript i should start at one and increase by one until it reaches the value n. And this whole, all this notation is basically saying the exact same thing as what we saw before. That we're starting out with i equals one, x sub one, and then increasing i by one to get plus x sub two. The plus comes from the summation, the sigma part of it. Um, and then this notation here just tells us to go in this sort of order, adding up as we go until we get i equals n at the top. And then we divide the whole thing by n. And that's a very general form of writing out what the average or arithmetic mean is um, for some sample value. Okay, so I wanted to walk through this in detail. Hopefully it wasn't too excruciatingly painful. Um, but if you hadn't seen it before, hopefully you understand it better. And if you still don't understand it completely, I will say maybe go and watch this part again or review the notes at least online, uh, because we're gonna use notation like this quite a bit throughout this course, and just as all throughout the world of statistics. Um, so make sure you're comfortable with it. Uh, at least before you get to the next lecture, because it's going to be important um, and you will not understand a lot of things if you don't understand this right now. Okay, um, I'm going to set the mean aside, just say this is our equation for it and move on to another concept called the median. Uh, so this is another way to uh, interpret average or central tendency in some distribution or sample of a population. So this is... Um, the middle value in an ordered list of the values in a sample. Uh, so this is interesting because it kind of winds up giving us a slightly different picture of what is going on in a distribution. Um, but what I mean by the middle value in an ordered list of the values in a sample, um, you order all the values x sub one, x sub two, x sub three, so on and so forth from like smallest to largest. Uh, and then what you do is you pick the value in the middle of that ordered list altogether. If there's an odd number of values in a sample, the median is just is easy to calculate. You just pick the number in the middle of the ordered list. So let's say uh, we pick three p pods. I'll give you a very simple example. We had three p pods. Uh, the first had five p's in it. The second had seven. The third had four. Um, what you do is reorder this whole thing from sort of lowest to highest. So you reorder it in terms of like four, five, seven 
just three all together, right? That's an odd number. Uh, so the median is five, which is the one in the middle of that ordered list. There's also one other value above it at seven and another below it at four. So you just pick the one in the middle and that's the median. Um, the median value isn't really affected by these values on the other side of it at all, other than the fact that they have to be put in the right order with each other. Um, since our peapod samples had an even number of values, we picked 12 each, we actually have a bit more work to do than just looking for the sort of one in the middle of the list. That is very convenient for an odd number of values for the even number of value situation. What we do, I'll show you how this works with our particular peapod samples. Number one, make an ordered list of all the values. So I rejiggered everything we saw before, such that we're going from lowest to highest for both Steve and Svetlana here. Um, yeah, so like I have a bunch of sixes, then some sevens, then some eights, and I have 12 total peapod samples here. So there's no like middle value, right? With three, we had one in the middle and then one on each side. So it was balanced out that way. The middle values here will be like number six and number seven. Um, but we can't, there's like no like value 6.5 that we can pick like in the middle here. Uh, so without that, what we do is we pick these two in the middle, number six and the se number seven. So they each have like five on either side, the first five and the last five. These we pick as the middle ones. And then we take the arithmetic mean of those two values and say that that's the median. Um, so in this case, it's going to be super simple to calculate that. Both of my middle values are seven. Both of Svetlana's middle values are eight. So my median is going to be seven and her median is going to be eight. Uh, but it could, you know, if one of these values have been like six and the other have been seven for me, then my median would be like 6.5. Or if hers were eight and 10, then the average of eight and 10 is nine, that sort of thing. Um, that's how you calculate the median in an even number of samples cases, case, uh, I guess. Um, and the interesting thing to note here is that you get different values for the medians than you got for the means. They don't give you the exact same sort of information. Um, so Svetlana's mean was 7.33333, 7 and a third, and then her median is eight. Uh, so the median is higher than the mean. And the same thing is true for me, just not quite as much. So my mean was 6.91, so on and so forth. And my median is seven. Um, so in both cases, the median is higher. That's not always gonna be the case. Um, but um, what this shows you is something interesting, an interesting feature of these two measures of central tendency. Uh, so basically the mean uh, as a measure of central tendency can be affected more by extreme values on the edge of a distribution in a way that the median will not be affected. Um, so to show you exactly what I mean here, I'll go to another slide. Um, so look at Svetlana's uh, sample of peas. Um, and we've got a couple fours here, fours here down at the low ends, one seven, a whole bunch of eights and a nine. Um, so her median is down here between six and seven, it's basically eight. Uh, even though she got so many different values of eight here and only one seven and one nine on either side of them, her mean is not eight. Um, it gets pushed down a lot by these two fours, uh, the two sort of bad luck pea pods that she got. Um, so let's say if we were to replace those fours with sevens, uh, then it would change her mean uh, a fair amount. It would go from seven and a third to 7.833 something. Um, but the median wouldn't change at all because these are still gonna be the meet, like the middle values of this ordered set, right? Uh, these would be sevens. That wouldn't change a thing as far as the median is concerned. Um, so things are a little bit different for my um, sample of pea pods because I don't have as many extreme value. I don't really have any extreme values. I just have sixes, sevens, and eight. So sixes, sevens, and eights. Got to watch my sixes and sevens there. Uh, anyways, uh, so my median and mean are pretty close to one another because there aren't that many extreme values basically. Um, but the point is that the median winds up being a more stable representation of central tendency than the mean does. Um, yeah, so if you are calculating the mean for whatever reason and whatever sort of sample you've got, um, keep that in mind, uh, that it can be affected a lot by what we call outliers, basically, um, values on the extreme edge of the distribution. There's another interpretation of average, um, which you may have heard of as well, it's called the mode. Uh, and normally if you were to ask somebody for the average value of some distribution, they wouldn't normally come up with this. Uh, but I have, uh, <laughs> I have seen it pop up in kind of funny places like 
Um, I think uh, our teaching evaluation ratings were just rejiggered by the administration in their infinite, infinite wisdom. Uh, they're gonna give us the mode of ratings that we got. So like if one through five, uh, well, I'll explain what that means here in a second, but it, it, it's an odd way to do it. Um, but how does the mode work? Uh, this is simply the particular value that is most commonly found in the sample. Um, so this is actually pretty easy to calculate for the small samples, such as the two we've been working with. Um, once you get to a lot of numbers, it can become um, quite a pain in the butt, but that's where a program like R will come in to help you out. So let's look at this with respect to like Svetlana's sample. Um, so actually go back, we'll do the same thing I just was talking about. So go through Svetlana's sample. How many times does she get four peas in a pod? Twice. How many times does she get seven? Once. How many times does she get eight? Uh, she gets eight eighths and she gets one nine. So we can put that all on a table um, like this one, since I've already done this. Uh, but basically what you're picking is which one of these numbers, which one of these sample values has the most number of observations in this little sample. And it's eight, right? That's the mode of Svetlana's um, distribution here. It's got eight observations. With my P pod uh, samples, it gets a little more interesting. So I had four sixes, five sevens, and three eights. It's still easy to figure out what the mode is though. It's the one with the most number of observations. It's number seven. Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, you can also think about this a little bit with respect to what we said about medians and means. So uh, Svetlana's median is eight, her mode is eight, her mean is seven and a third. Um, my mode and median will wind up being the same thing. They're both seven in that um, distribution and my mean is a little bit lower at 6.91 or whatever. Uh, so that's not always gonna be the case. You could wind up getting, you know, something totally different for your mode, which is, you know, if you happen to have like a bunch of twos and then like a bunch of higher numbers as well, um, you could get a weird sort of representation of your data from looking at the mode, which is why I don't agree with the administration about their teacher ratings, but I don't agree with them about a lot of things. So what else is new? Anyways, uh, it's not always gonna be the case that the mode is gonna look like the median or the mean. These are all three different ways of representing the central tendency of a distribution. Uh, and this leads me to one other thing I wanna get across before we say goodbye for today, but it's possible for a distribution to have more than one mode. Um, so in this case, the distribution may be bimodal if it has two modes, modes or multimodal even uh, if it has more than two modes. Um, and you're not likely to get that sort of picture in your data a lot um, if you're collecting linguistic data out there, but it's possible. Um, so bimodal or multimodal distributions are usually pretty easy to spot once you graph out the distribution in what's called a histogram, which shows you the distribution shape. Um, so I um, am um, going to show you a few examples of what I mean by this, uh, but I'm also going to um, show you, uh, uh, give you a definition of what a histogram is first. So a histogram breaks the range of values of a variable into classes and displays the count or percent of the observations that fall into each class. Uh, and when we start making histograms, we're starting to get into um, visions of what a shape of a distribution looks, at, looks like. So moving on from just measures of central tendency, we're gonna get a picture of a distribution to try to figure out what it's telling us or what sort of distribution we've got. <clears throat> And usually the basic way to do this is to create a histogram. Um, I will tell you, since we're linguistics nerds here, uh, this word is a combination of the ancient Greek roots histos, histos maybe, meaning master web and gram, meaning written representation. And I actually don't really know why they chose that form or that combination of words to represent this. But maybe when you look at this, it might represent you, might look like masts on a ship or something like that. I don't know, like one of those old tall ships with sails. Uh, so what I want to show you is how to plot this in R. It's actually quite simple. Uh, and what you get out of this, this is my P data. Um, this is an R um, histogram. Um, and I'll show you the code for this down below. Uh, we'll get more experience trying to interpret this, but that's how you, if you put these commands into your um, R console, you'll get a picture that looks like this. Uh, but basically this is what it is showing you what we already knew. So I had, um, four P pods that had six P's in them. So the number of P's here down on the bottom is six. Uh, and I had four in terms of my frequency, that's the number of P pods. 
five had seven, so we bumped that up a little bit, and then three had eight. And we're starting to get a sense of sort of like a distribution. It doesn't look like one of those bell curves, but it looks a little bit like one of them, right? Uh, you can also easily see the mode of this guy. It's seven because that one pops up highest um, on this y-axis. Uh, we can also see that with Svetlana's, hers is a little more, um, I guess, interesting or complicated uh, and that it looks like this. There's a lot of eights, right? There's eight of them and then these two, four values down here. Um, and then there's code here at the bottom for how to create this in R. Um, I wanna actually put this code into R so you can see how this works. We'll talk more about this in the future. Uh, unfortunately, for some reason, I cannot just copy and paste this from PowerPoint to uh, R. I found, no, I can, look at that. <laughs> okay, never mind. Uh, I'm going to create a little, what we call a vector here called Steve, um, with my P pod values ranging from six to eight. Uh, and this is just the syntax for how to do that. Uh, this is say, uh, it's a C, uh, it's a C command. Yeah. Uh, to put all these values in, you put them all in parentheses and the C says combine them into something called Steve using this little arrow notation. Um, if I hit, um, return there and then type out Steve, it'll tell me just what I told it. Um, which is that ranges from six to eight. Uh, and let me try to create a histogram using this command. I'm not gonna walk you through all the details of this, um, but it starts off with hist, which means make a histogram. Um, I guess I might walk you through the details, but it's saying using use Steve as your data source. Uh, and then this breaks part is say, uh, is something that I put in there knowing what this is gonna look like. It just says um, break up this X axis at these spots uh, at like 5.5, 6.5, 7.5, so on and so forth. Um, this shows you the range on the x-axis and this gives you a label at the top of the graph, or sorry, at the bottom of the graph down here. So let's hit return, ta-da, and I got that histogram that I just showed you in the PowerPoint slide. Um, you have to kind of like resize <laughs> it a little bit to make it look nice and pretty, uh, but that's how you make a histogram. Um, the only part of this that might be slightly obnoxious is typing all these numbers into um, the uh, our console, but I'll show you a way to get around that um, as we move on. And this gives me a picture of what my distribution looks like. It always makes sense to take a look at a um, picture of the distribution in your data, just so you can make sure you know what you're looking at. Um, yeah, so like I said, it's easy to identify the mode in each histogram. It's simply the tallest column in each graph. And I was mentioning bimodal distributions um, a second ago, and that's one that has two modes. So technically speaking, that should be um, a histogram that shows you two equally highest points like this one. Um, and these are like truly equally highest points here. Uh, I don't, this is not real data, so I'm not telling you what's on the X or Y axis, but you can maybe think about this um, like in linguistics terms, like maybe uh, if you're looking at say um, the F0, the fundamental frequency of say female versus male voices, you might get an equal number of observations of a lower F0 for men and a higher F0 for women, that sort of thing. Uh, what you tend to find in the real world though is that things are not that nice and neat. This is just sort of an abstractly mathematically generated curve. Um, if you actually collect data out in the world, uh, things get messy. So when people see a curve that looks like this, um, which doesn't have exactly um, two highest points in the distribution curve, uh, but has kind of like two bumps. Uh, in this case, this is one representing the average female weight, not one representing the average male weight. Um, people will start talking about like that's a bimodal distribution because it's not just like one bump in the middle of the distribution or the middle of the curve. Um, but there's still kind of like two separate bumps, um, which are, you know, related to each other, but not, and not totally separate from each other, but clear enough, clearly distinct enough for people to think about, you know, they represent two populations. Um, so yeah, when people will see something like this during a talk or something, they will talk about it being bimodal. Uh, we'll take a closer look at the different kinds of distribution shapes we can expect to see next time. So we don't have to kind of like be all fuzzy about what kind of curves we're looking at, but I think we've talked about enough. Uh, at this point, just looking at measures of central tendency. And like I said, um, maybe you already knew all that stuff before, but that's not a problem. It's good to know things. And if you didn't um, before this lecture, hopefully you know it now. And we'll build on that next time when we look at um, distribution shapes. Okay, I will look forward to seeing you then.